Good evening. I think it's time to get started tonight. Amen. Good to see all you here. Yeah, things are a little bit different tonight. I guess you've heard about all the COVID and different people that are being sick. So I don't know a lot about announcements. I did hear that the picnic was canceled for now because of COVID and everything. So uh, but other than that, I don't know a lot about any other announcements. If you have anything here, anybody knows anything that you share with anybody? Okay. Anybody have any prayer requests? Yes, Brother Jim. Amen. Pray for Brother Jack. He plays the saxophone. He had to have his uh, gallbladder taken out. Kind of a, I won't say emergency, but they said it needs to come out right now. So they took it out. He's recovering at home. It's just kind of weak. So remember Brother Jack. I know he would appreciate it. Uh, Rick and Jamie. Penny's not feeling well tonight. She's not really, really sick, but she was afraid she might be catching something. Did not want to bring it to any of you guys. So pray for her. Yes, Brother Rick. Amen. Scarlet Rose, pretty name. Blood blue. Amen. Okay. Bill and Margaret. Bill and Margaret. Okay. Yes. Unspoken. All right. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we come before you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this evening that you have given to us. We pray your blessings would be upon us. We've come here tonight to have church. We don't have a large crowd, but you said all we needed was you and some other people, two or more, that would gather in your name, we could have church. So, Father, that's what we plan on doing tonight. We lift all of these requests up to you, Father. You know about each and every one of them. And we just ask for healing with all those who are struggling with this COVID sickness now. Bring them back to us healed and ready to go. And, Father, all those who have had surgeries, that they would heal up also. We just ask for your blessings upon this service. In Jesus' name, amen. 
and amen. Going to do things a little bit different tonight. We don't have our little band. Uh, I guess because of COVID, they called in and we couldn't have a music practice tonight. So I pulled out my old acoustic. I hadn't played in a long, long time, so I'm pretty rusty on it. But we're going to try to do a few songs. Don't have them on the overhead. Didn't have time to get all that together. So but if you know them, sing along. Amen. Love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love you, Lord You have led me through the fire in the darkest night, you're close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You're close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Has God been faithful to you? Amen. Amen. I don't know. Some of these songs you may have never heard. Some of them you might have. This little song here is about the times that we have failed to realize the power and the significance of God, who he really is. And uh, we put more faith in man than we have in God. And uh, this person that wrote this song realized that and uh, repented of it and uh, began to glorify and magnify God. So I'm going to try to sing it. It's been a long time. I have made you too small in my eyes. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. But now, oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. 
and in my eyes and with my song O oh Lord be magnified O oh Lord be magnified be magnified O oh Lord you are highly exalted and there is nothing you can do. Oh Lord, my eyes are on you. Be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. And I have leaned on the wisdom of men. Oh Lord, forgive me and I have responded to them instead of your light and your mercy but now oh Lord I see my wrong heal my heart and show yourself strong and in my eyes and with my song, O oh Lord, be magnified. O oh Lord, be magnified. Be magnified, O oh Lord. You are highly exalted, and there is nothing you can do oh lord my eyes are on you be magnified oh lord be magnified amen can you magnify him tonight amen this little song says the more i seek you the more i find you that's what the Bible says. If we'll draw nigh unto him, he will draw nigh unto us. But also the more we seek him and find him, the more we love him. Amen? Amen. Here we go. Let's try this little song. The more I seek you, the more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe Feel your heart beat This love is so deep It's more than I can stand And I melt in your peace It's overwhelming So overwhelming Your love for me Oh Lord, can't you see your love? Your love is overwhelming so overwhelming, Lord, to me, so peacefully, Lord, so overwhelming. The more I seek you, the more I find you, the more I find you. The more I love you, I want to sit at your feet from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. So overwhelming, your love for me, 
Lord, can't you see your love is overwhelming, so overwhelming, Lord, for me. Oh, can't you see, Lord, your love is overwhelming. Amen. And one last one. And one more, and then we'll preach. You probably never heard this song. I may not be able to find it. Here we go. But you probably never heard it. But it's from the perspective of someone who recognizes men like David, the psalmist. What a powerful man of God David was. Well, I know I'll never be a psalmist like David. I mean, none of us will be, really. He was a man after God's own heart. He had the special gifting of God. And um, I can't even begin to attain anything like David. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest preachers that the world has ever known. You can't be like him either. But the person who wrote this song realized he couldn't be like any of those people. But one thing he could do, he could worship God. And that's something all of us can do. We can worship God. God. We have a testimony, and this is a little testimony from someone with a kind of a, I shouldn't say a simple mind, but a simple outlook on how good God is, no matter who we are. Amen. Here we are. I'll try to sing it for you. David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. And Paul preached all her laws save knowing Christ. Little John said he's precious while leaning on his bosom. So for a moment may I humbly testify. Did I mention that I love him? How I work and adore him when I can see no way he makes a way and did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he ever made me I love him and that's all I want to say David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. And Paul preached all her laws, save knowing Christ. Little John said he's precious while leaning on his bosom. So for a moment, may I haunt testify did I mention that I love him how I worship and adore him when I can see no way he makes a way and did I mention he's been faithful to every promise he ever made me and I love him and that's all I want to say and I love him that's all I want to say amen do you love him tonight amen the greatest testimony of all let me put this guitar up real quick I knew there wouldn't be many people here tonight with all the sickness and different things. But like I said earlier, I come to have church tonight. Amen. I heard they're going to have a church format from here on out. And so I said, well, then if we're going to do that, why don't we have church? Amen. Come here to worship God, look into his word.
And uh, so tonight, I'm going to share from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flocks to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of a fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses. And he hid his face, excuse me, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them out to a land, to a good land, a large land, and to a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, once again, as we bring forth your word tonight, we realize that in ourselves, we can do very little. But with you and by your Holy Spirit and by your anointing, Father, your word will go out and it will not return void, but it will accomplish what you have sent it to do. And we are asking tonight that your Holy Spirit will will be in this service, Lord. You will touch our lives. You will start a revival fire in each and every one of us tonight. Though there's just a few here, Lord, you're here. And that's what matters. We didn't just come to have a meeting with them. We had to come a meeting with you. Come here to meet you, God, tonight. And I ask, Father, that you would demonstrate your love, your power, and your mercy by your Holy Spirit in the preaching of your word. We'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to title the message tonight, Faded Dreams. Faded Dreams. All of us have had dreams, sometimes spiritual dreams, but we've all had visions also that God has And really, that's really what I'm talking about. God has given probably every one of you some kind of a vision something he wants you to do in life and you were all excited about it and you were ready to get going but it seemed like it all just went to nothing and it doesn't seem possible that it could ever ever never ever happen now as you look back on things and that dream has faded just about into oblivion and you've pretty much almost forgotten about it I want you to show you from Moses perspective tonight don't ever give up don't ever give. God gave you a word. God, he, he does not repent of his gifts and his callings. If God has called us to something, he's going to complete that work in us. Whether we go along with it at the time, that's different. He will get our attention. So that's what I want to bring out here tonight. And we want to look at this man named Moses. But I want you to notice something that God said. He told Moses, he said, Moses, I have seen. Do you know God sees us? He said, I have seen what's going on in Egypt. He said, and I have heard my people's cry. I hear them. I know they're in bondage. I know they're suffering. There's a lot of pain and agony going on. He says, I know about it. But he proves that he cares. He said, and I'm coming down. He said, I see what's going on. I hear what's going on. I know I care, and I'm going to do something. I'm coming down to deliver my people, but I'm going to use you, Moses. Now, that probably shocked Moses at this time in his life. He's about 80 years old, and God said, I'm going to use you to deliver my people out of Egypt. Now, Moses had this call 40-something years prior to this. We'll find out in a little bit. This was not something new 
to Moses. This was not the first time Moses had ever felt this calling for the children of Israel. You see, Moses was not in Egypt anymore. Though he was born there, he wasn't there anymore. And Moses had no idea what was going on in Egypt. He couldn't see the people in Egypt. He couldn't hear their cries. He had no idea what it was. He could only speculate about his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam and the people that he had left 40-something years running from Pharaoh, Pharaoh, fearing for his very life. And they would have killed him if they had caught Moses. It's been 40 years now since he tried to deliver Israel with his own arm, and he failed. And he fled to Midian, if you know the story. Became a shepherd. Moses is now a shepherd. Not just a shepherd, he's a shepherd of his father-in-law's sheep. Now that could be very degrading at times. There are some good father-in-laws. There's some, probably some sons that love, son-in-laws that love working for their father-in-law. But for the most part, it's kind of degrading to end up working for your father-in-law. Because it usually means your wife got you a job with her daddy. And you better go to work with him or else. So here Moses was this. Moses was a mighty man at one time. Moses was a powerful man at one time. And here he is, a shepherd, tending his father-in-law's sheep at Mount Horeb. And all of a sudden, out of a burning bush, God speaks to him. He got his attention. Wouldn't it get yours? Amen? Because that bush was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And Moses turned aside and said, I've got to, I've got to see this. And God, you know the story, we just read it. He spoke to Moses out of the burning bush bush but notice in verse 10 come now therefore I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt and Moses said God who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt he said Lord me why would you call me because God was giving him a second chance. God was reviving a dream that Moses had had 40 years prior to that. And God hadn't forgotten about it. And now it was time. The fullness of time had come. God said, I'm coming down, and by you, Moses, I'm going to deliver my people. Why is Moses in Midian? I gave you a little hint of it. But why, is he, why is he there? He was born in Egypt. What's he doing in Midian? Why is he tending someone else's flocks? You remember the story of Moses? In Egypt, they were killing all the, the male children. Remember the male Hebrew children? Because the Hebrews were beginning to outnumber the Egyptians. So Pharaoh made a decree. All male Hebrew children would be killed at birth. And all of the handmaidens, the birthing nurse in birth, were supposed to kill them on the stools, but they refused to do it. And Moses was one, if you remember, they, they built a little ark for him, put him in that ark, put him in the Nile River with all the crocodiles, and trusted God to keep him safe. If you remember the story, Pharaoh's daughter came along, she found Moses, they took him in, and of course, his sister saw everything that was happening. She went in, knowing that this Pharaoh's daughter would need someone to nurse that baby. She said, I know just the person. I've got someone that can nurse this baby child until he is weaned. And if you remember the story, it was his own mother, Jochebed. Moses ended up being weaned by his own mother, Jochebed. And that's very important because I believe Jochebed instilled a lot of things in Moses the time that she had him as a little child. She never let him forget who he was, that he was a Hebrew. He wasn't an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew, and she was not going to let him ever forget that. Now, as Moses grew up in the palace, he had everything he wanted or could want. Some would say he had the life of Riley. I mean, we're not talking about he just got to become into some Egyptian, some wealthy Egyptian. The Pharaoh. You couldn't get any higher than the Pharaoh. He was somebody. People have referred to Moses as the prince of Egypt at one time. We don't know that for sure, but he was somebody in Egypt, he had a lot of power. He did a lot of things. And something drastic must have happened in Moses' life at about 40 years old. Because 
out of nowhere, and it seems in the Bible, of course, we know what happened. Everything changed in Moses' life. He was living in a life of luxury. He had it made. He was somebody. And he was probably even in line to become an heir to the throne, possibly in Egypt because of who his stepmother was. He had it made. But notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. It begins to shed a little bit of light of why Moses is in Midian at this time. Moses chapter 11. Verse 23. The Hall of Faith, chapter 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. They said, no, God's hand is upon our boy. And they hid him for three months. And all the while, his mama, even as a, an infant, she was instilling who he was. By faith, Moses when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now think about that. He said, that's not my mama. He's about 40 years old. He comes to this realization. He says, you know what? That's not my mama. I refused to call her my mother because that's not my real mother. My mother is a Hebrew. Now that took a lot of courage to do that. Some would tell you, say he was stupid to do it. Something happened in Moses' life to cause him to do that. He was not a stupid man. Something drastically, radically happened in Moses' life. And notice what it goes on to say. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He said, I'd rather suffer. I know leaving my heritage here or my lap of luxury here in Egypt and going out being with the Hebrews, I'm going to suffer. He said, I understand that. I know that my lifestyle is going to change drastically. But he chose it. It was not something forced upon him. He chose rather to choose the affliction of God's people and to suffer with them than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He had it made in Egypt. Something happened in Moses' life that changed him. In verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You see, Moses understood, even being raised as an Egyptian, he was raised, he was learned in all the ways of Egypt, but he understood Hebrews, that there was a God in heaven. And there was such a thing as called eternal life. And yes, he could enjoy a sinful lifestyle in Egypt. He could have anything he wanted. But he chose rather to go and be with the Hebrew people who were suffering tremendously. Because I believe when he was a little baby and his mother was weaning him, because it took longer to wean than what you think. It was several years she probably had him. She was telling him who he was. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you are descendants of them. You are a Hebrew. You're not an Egyptian. Don't ever forget your roots, Moses. Don't ever forget that. But it took more than just a mama doing that. I shared at my Aunt Bibby's uh, service the other day that even when I was a little boy, I, I must not have been that big. But she instilled in me some things that I've never forgot to this day. And so I know Jochebed instilled some things into Moses that, that he never forgot. But still, I believe something Something more powerful happened than just his mother's voice speaking to him, said, you're, you're a Hebrew. Don't you, don't you claim those Egyptians. When you get of a certain age, you refuse to be called an Egyptian. You're a, a Hebrew. I know that was in his heritage, but it was deeper than that. And let's look at chapter 7 of the book of Acts, because I believe Stephen sheds a little bit of light on this situation as to why Moses would make such a drastic change in his life. Why would he choose to suffer when he had it made? Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen when he's preaching just before he's going to be stoned. And he's explaining to those who are going to stone him. 
He's preaching one of the greatest sermons you'll ever read in the Bible. I mean, he just puts it all together. And he begins talking about Moses here in verse 21. It said, And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Talking about when Pharaoh's daughter took him into Egypt and more or less adopted him and began raising him, feeding him, and him becoming raised in the palace. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian and was mighty, notice it, in words and in deeds. That's important. You see, when God comes his second time and says, Moses, I want you to deliver my, my people, Moses says, Lord, I can't even speak. I, I'm slow to speak. And a lot of people believe that Moses might have been born with some kind of a speech impediment. I don't believe that according to the Scriptures. And he was, at one time, he was mighty in words, which some of the translations said he was a mighty orator. The man could get up and speak eloquently. He was mighty in words. But not only in words, but in deeds. He, he no doubt, built things in Egypt, or at least had them built. He, he was somebody. He was a mover and a shaker in Egypt. Do you see that in the Bible? I do. And Moses learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. He knew who he was. He knew he was a Hebrew. He understood that. He said, you know what? I'm going to go visit my people. I'm going to see how it is in Goshen. I, I want to see how my people are living, the people that I was birthed from. My brother, my sister. I want to see how it is with them. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. He went out and he saw these Egyptians, how they were treating these Hebrew people. They were slaves. These taskmasters had whips. They would beat them with these whips. It was a cruel, cruel thing. Very difficult. No doubt if they disobeyed... Many of them probably were killed. And this guy was probably going to kill this Hebrew. And Moses stepped in and he killed the Egyptian. Very serious thing that Moses did. But verse 25 says, For he supposed they would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. You see, God had put it in Moses' heart at this time to go deliver my people. He knew he was supposed to do that, but he thought God was going to do it by his hand. He said, I'll go visit my people, and I'll go out there, and I'll begin to maybe deliver them. Maybe there's something I can do. I don't know all that, but it's plain from the word that Moses, it was in his heart at this time in his life to deliver the people. This was not some new revelation on the mountain. This was something God had told him he was going to do years before, but surely Moses had forgotten about it, or at least put it in the back of his mind and thinking, it'll never happen. There's no way. I'm a, I'm a shepherd in Midian. And I have no idea what's happening in Egypt, but God says, but I see, I hear, I know, and Moses, I'm coming down to deliver my people, and I'm going to use you to do it. Why is that so significant for us? Because I think the same thing has happened to us many times. But too many times God gives us a vision and we add too much of ourselves into that vision. And we expect a certain way for it to turn out or that we've got to force it and too many times we force it in the wrong direction. And usually if it's hindered, it's because we did it. <laughs> when God first called me into the ministry... Because of the person I was, the bashful person I was, I thought, wow, th this is going to be phenomenal. People are going to come for miles to see me preach because they, they know me. The boy can't even speak. He can't even talk to people. can't even order a hamburger at the drive through We got to come see this. And I could picture my name in the marquee on the Baptist church or the churches in Paris. The Reverend Arlen Beck preaching tonight. It is going to be packed with all of my peers and all the people that knew me growing up. They're just going to say, we got to see this. Well, that was lifted up in myself. Because God put it in my heart, one day you will preach to the people in parish. You will stand in these churches, and you'll have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus. So I thought, hey, man, what's wrong with the marquee with my name on it? 
But that's not what God was talking about. And I look back now, and just this last Saturday, I was standing in a church in Parish. The congregation. A church, a brand new church. It wasn't even there when I got saved. It was at a funeral, but that's where been most of the times I have opportunity to preach in Parish has been at someone's service. But still, the people that knew me, growing up, they said, man, there's something different about him. What happened to Arlen? But you see, I had this wrong vision of what it was going to be, how it was going to turn out. It had nothing to do with lights flashing and marquees and anything like that. It was flesh. Well, Moses got into the flesh too. Do you see that? He said, I know God's got a call. It's in my heart. God put it in his heart to help these people. They were Hebrews. He felt a kindred spirit. He went out, but he did it in the flesh. He killed this Egyptian supposing that his brethren would be on his side. So, hey, I did it for you guys because he looked around made sure there were no more Egyptians, and he killed this guy. But evidently, the Hebrew other people saw it. So the next day, Moses goes back out and says, okay, I'm going to continue my work. And he sees a Hebrew mistreating another Hebrew. He says, hey, you shouldn't treat your brother like, what are you going to do, kill me like you did the Egyptian? And Moses says, whoa, i got to get out of here. This is known. And he flees, and now he's in Midian. He's a shepherd. And no doubt his vision, his dream has died. But God's not through with Moses. God's not through with you. God's not through with any of us until he fulfills his will and purpose in our life. And God said, this is the will for your life, Moses. You will deliver the children of Israel by my hand. As a matter of fact, God told him, he said, this is going to be a token. Not only am I speaking to you in this mountain, but I'm telling you, there will be a day when you will come here again to this mountain with the children of Israel and make a covenant with me. And that's exactly what happened years later when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They came back to that same mountain. I can only imagine Moses saying there, wow, what a God we serve. He told me this would happen. And Moses goes up and gets the Ten Commandments. See how his dream was dead? But now look, God has revived it. And not only revived it, but done things that Moses couldn't have imagined. And God wants to do that in our lives. I really believe that, church. I was very disappointed when it didn't work out with Patrick. I'll be honest with you. I thought, oh, man, I really, I've been watching every week, watching it grow. I said, man, the church seems to be growing. Man, that's great. I was excited. I said, man, this is great. And it all kind of went south. So I reached out to Rick. I said, brother, and I, I kind of seen the handwriting on the wall a couple of weeks ago. And I said, hey, if, if worst case scenario, I'll help you, brother. I ain't going to leave you <laughs> holding the bag. Amen. So, no, this wasn't what I had planned. But I read stories like this. I say, you know, God's got different ways of doing things. And really, this plan could be even better than what we had planned. And I believe it is going to be better. I really do. We just got to trust God through every bit of it. And in the end, we'll look back and say, wow, God, you brought revival when we thought it was going to be a bad thing. You took it and you brought something and made it very, very good. I can't see that clock. Okay, I got 15 more minutes. We're moving right along here. I hope you're getting the picture of some man, his dream no doubt was gone. There was no way Moses thought he would ever probably even go back to Egypt, let alone go back and deliver the children of Israel out with a mighty hand of God with him. But now all of a sudden God says, Moses, you're the man. I put it in your heart 40 years ago. And like I said, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. But this time, get your perspective right. It's not going to be by your strong arm, Moses. It's going to be my arm and you working through me. And that's what we have to do. When we get a vision from the Lord, we have to realize that some of us, we, we get it in our head wrong. And once we surrender it back to God, say, okay, now God, clear it up for me. It's time. God can work with us and do some great and mighty things. But if you remember the story, how it goes on, Moses 
he argues, who, who am I? Who am I? I can't talk. I, I can't speak. But yet we found out from the scriptures and from, from uh, Stephen that he was a mighty man of word at one time. And I believe when we don't speak for a while, we get to where we can't speak. Did you know that? One reason I couldn't speak because I never spoke before. I wouldn't talk. I get in a crowd, people were talking. I never said anything. I listened. I was a listener. I've been a listener all my life. And that came in handy in certain times. But the only problem was that you never talk. And when it comes time for you to talk, you don't know how to talk. You stumble around, you stammer, and you're all nervous, and you can't speak, and you just, it's crazy. And I'm not proud of this, but before I was a Christian, I had the most filthy mouth you can imagine. I could talk with the worst of the truck drivers out there, not picking on truck drivers. Dragline operators, bulldozer operators, never, no, no offense. <laughs> and I, I hid behind that. I could talk that smack, but when it came to a conversation, I was so nervous and bashful, I couldn't speak. And because I didn't, when it came time to speak, I didn't know how to speak. And when I get home, most of you know my wife, her, her mother says she was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. Is there a battery we can take out of this child? She won't shut up. So when I would get home, Penny would, but she hadn't seen me all day. She would talk the rest of the day. So I never got a chance to talk. And I believe that happened to Moses. He just fell into his little world as a shepherd and went out tending sheep little by little. He didn't have the eloquence he had at one time. And now he was afraid. He tried to step out once before. And that's where we're at many times. Whoa, no, 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 no. I did that. I tried that, God. Yeah, I stuck my neck out. And I about got, you know, cut off. God says, no. I'm calling you, Moses. You're the one. Well, Moses says, but, Mo but fuck God. Who, who am I going to tell sent me? What's, what am I supposed to tell these people? Who, who, who sends me? I got to have somebody. When I go to the elders of Israel and they say, well, who sent you to deliver us? What, what am I supposed to tell them? Verse 14. Notice what the Bible says. Chapter 3 of the book of Exodus. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am, he said. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Now, for us, that's a very strange term. If I came to you and said, you know, someone sent me to tell you, did you say, well, well who told you I am? You are what? I am sent me. You'd think they were crazy, wouldn't you? It didn't make any sense to us. But to the children of Israel, the elders of Israel, it would make plenty of sense when he came and said, the I am have sent me. Now, God could have said a lot of different things. He could have used many of his names to go. And they would have understood who Moses was talking about. He could have said, you tell him Elion has sent me. He said, well, who is Elion? When, when Abraham rescued Lot, remember when the kings came and they made war and they took Abraham's nephew and took him away as part of the spoil. Abraham went back and he, he took everything away from him. He got his nephew back and he went to the prince of Salem, Melchizedek. He paid tithes unto Melchizedek. And he blessed the Lord. And he said, the most high God gets the credit. Elion, the most high God. God could have said, Moses, just go tell him that Elion sent you. The most high God. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, that sounds like that would work to me. You go tell them that Elion, the most high God, there's none higher. The most high God has sent me. But God said, no, I am that I am have sent thee. He could have said, well, tell them that El Royai has sent you. You might say, well, well, who is that? Remember Hagar? She became pregnant with Abraham's child, Ishmael. Sarah got very angry and jealous. She hated Hagar. And she sent him away. And she went out to a, a, a well, a spring, and was crying. And the Lord showed up and said, Hagar, the child in you is going to be a great and a mighty nation. 
and thou God seeth me, she said. El, El Roy, that means thou God seeth. Go back and tell them, El Roy, thou God seeth. They might say, well, good, God sees what's happening. That's a good thing. We would like it for El Roy I to come. He said, no, I'm not going to use that name either. Say, Man, God, what's going on here? He could have said, well, go tell them that El Shaddai has sent me. I even like that one. El Shaddai. That just sounds good. El Shaddai. Wow, that ought to get their attention. El Shaddai. Well, what does that mean? Almighty God. Go tell him, Almighty God sent you. God says, no, Moses, that's not the name we're going to use. Wow. Elohim. Abraham and Abimelech. Abimelech wanted to make a covenant with Abraham because of a well they had been fighting over. And he tried to make this deal, so Abraham said, so we don't fight. And he called out on the Lord, and it's the everlasting God, Elohim. I don't pronounce these names very good, but. You get in the picture, I think. The everlasting God. No. God said, I am. Why did he say I am? Why is he wanting him to go in the name of I am and not these other names? He could have used any one of them. Because he said, I am what you need. I am what they need. I can give you everything you need. And I am to you, Moses, I am one that is able to deliver these people out of the bondage of these Egyptians. The I am hath sent thee. Well, what if I get hungry, Lord? Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? I'm your provider. All these names of God have significance. What about I need some peace? What about, what about Jehovah Shalom? I am your peace. We can go on almost all night. Jehovah Nisi, I am your banner. When they went to battle, they had banners. Certain tribes had a, a banner they would go under. People would rally to that flag, if you will. It's kind of like us when they're going to battle. They lift up those flags, and it gives courage to the men. I'm Jehovah Nisi, your, your banner. Lift up the banner. Fight the devil. Rally underneath this cry. And we should be holding up the nail spell banner of Jesus Christ, church, to this world. Yes, we'll be rejected at times. Moses was. Who do we think we are? We must lift up the banner of Christ. You might say, well, I'm a sinner. But then you need Jehovah Tiskanu. I am the Lord thy salvation. You see, God's everything we need and more. But when he says, I am, that's everything. That covers all these things. I mean, you can't get any better than the I am. Remember what he also said? He said, I am coming down. Can I tell you Jesus Christ is coming back? Jesus came down once, and he came down because of what he saw. He saw an earth suffering with sin, and no one could do anything about it. He said, I'm going to go down. The I am came down to this earth, and he died. He bled and died for our sins. He said, well, no, no, that wasn't the I am. That was Jesus. He told those Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. They understood what Jesus was saying. They argued him. What is this man saying? He's not even 50 years old. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. They knew Jesus was claiming to be God, the I am. They wanted to kill him. That's blasphemy. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus said these words? I am the bread of life. I am from above. I am the good shepherd. I am the Lord and master. I am the eternal one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the true vine. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. That's what Jesus said. But this is the best one of all. I am he that was dead and am alive forevermore. I am is alive today, church. The same I am that spoke to Moses in the burning bush 
is with us tonight. we got to get a hold of this. Too many times we've sell God short. We shortened his arm. Isaiah said, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Has God revealed his arm of the Lord to us, or are we shortening his arm, afraid to let him move, afraid to let God do what he wants to in our lives and in our midst? Because he hasn't changed. God's not the one that changed. I hear there's a revival going on at some college in Kentucky, I believe it is. I guess they're shutting it down, some of the, the principals and things, and it's got to get back to class. But anyhow, still, God can do those things. God can still stir in the hearts and start fires of revival in all of us. In church, we need it. I need it. Maybe I'm just the only one that needs it. <laughs> Amen. Because God has some things that he wanted us to do years ago when we've become discouraged or forgot about it or let it slip or slide, whatever it is. God still has it there. and God wants to revive that. I believe in many of our lives. And I think God's starting to stir in our church to do that. I really do. Like I said, this is not the way I thought things were going to turn out. But as I'm beginning to look, I think this is, this is the way God intends things. Because I can see a lot of different doors opening now. There's a lot of different things happening. I was so frustrated watching Rick Sunday with his microphone. He kept... <laughs> I said, Lord, can't we afford a microphone? Don't jump all over the place. Well, I got to teach Rick how to put it on. I hadn't had to fight it too much tonight. <laughs> Amen. But God worked things out where actually the church is going to be so much more blessed financially because of the way things worked out. Rick told you, I'm not taking a dime for this. I don't want any pay. I don't want anything. For the, for the church to do better. We're fine. We're doing fine. And I think it's going to be able to open up some things. So poor Rick and them been wringing their hands, saying, how can we do this? And we, we don't want to overspend. We don't want to do, you know, we, but this area where our hands are tied. But God, God can open up that fountain somewhat through some of these situations. So keep praying for these things. I know it's time to quit. It's 6 o'clock. But if your dreams have faded... Because in some ways, my dream had faded here at this church. I thought, I'm done. You know, I, I'm done. I've done all I can, and it's kind of going down. And I don't want to hinder the church. I need, to, I need to move on. But I see God beginning to stir something. I don't know what he's doing exactly. But something's happening, church. You know, we always sing that song, something going on in the graveyard. Well, something's going on in the church house. Amen. Something's going on at Sun City Christian Center. Amen. Amen. Good to see all of y'all. I missed you. I really have missed you very much, and uh, it's good to see your smiling faces again. And uh, good Lord willing, Penny and I will both be here Sunday morning. So if you want to stand up, we'll be dismissed. I was going to have an altar call tonight, but I think everybody here is saved. Everybody I know knows the Lord, and uh, so I feel good about that. And, uh, but there's always, you can always come down here and pray for anything. But uh, as we leave tonight, be careful driving home. Uh, these roads can be very, very dangerous. Lost a few friends here lately through accidents. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit that we sense here tonight. I just pray your blessings upon each person that was here tonight, Lord God, that they would take whatever it might be. It doesn't matter how old we are. Or it doesn't matter how old our dreams and our, our visions are as we get in tune with you. And we finally say, okay, God. What is it now? Now that we've torn all my, my stuff away from it, show me clearly, God, what it is that, you, that your mighty hand, and you'll get all the glory. You'll get all the praise. You'll get all the honor for what you accomplished through us. You want to use us. I don't know why, but you do, God, and I humbly thank you for that. You want to use every one of us here. And Father, I'm excited about what you're going to do in this church in the near future. Go with us as we leave here. Keep us safe is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a good evening. Lord willing, see you Sunday, if not before. <laughs>